I'm Haley Cronquist, policy attorney here at the Long-Term Care Community Coalition. Uh, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to improving care and quality of life for those uh, who live in long-term care settings. Uh, we do that through policy research and analysis, systems advocacy, and public education. And we are also the home to two local long-term care ombudsman programs here in New York State. The next slide, please. Thanks. So today's webinar uh, features policy expert and long-term or long-time advocate Eileen Henshaw. Eileen has been working uh, with LTCCC for the past few months on various policy briefs, including the brief that she will discuss today, which is focused on transparency in nursing homes. And again, materials from today's webinar will be posted on our website in the next day or so. Um, so be sure to check it out if you wanna see her slides or watch the video again. Um, she has an excellent presentation ready for you all today. So thank you again for joining us and I will turn it over to Eileen. Thanks so much, Haley. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Before we get started, I'd like to thank Richard Mollett and the wonderful people at the Long-Term Care Community Coalition, including Haley, Eric Goldwine, and Sarah Rosenberg for the work they do each day to further quality care and for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Next slide, please. So for those of you who don't know me, I've been working in the field of long-term care advocacy for about three decades now. I started my professional career as an attorney, but I quickly pivoted to consumer advocacy when I discovered that representing manufacturers of toxic substances and similar clients was really not my thing. So early in my career, I worked with a small nonprofit on legislation to advance consumer protections, especially food safety. And then I served as legislative counsel to an organization that represented the state's chief legal officers. My nursing home advocacy began when my father became ill and he needed long-term care. I was appalled by the care he was receiving at one of the so-called top nursing homes in the state and I joined with other family members to form a statewide citizens advocacy organization. We later moved my father to a home in Virginia, and while the care in that home was better, there were still significant problems. Again, I worked with family members, and together we worked to stop some bad legislation. Fast forward, in 2001, I joined the State Government Affairs Department of AARP, and then for eight years, I led their state advocacy work on health and long-term care issues. I recently left AARP to work as a consultant, to travel, and to spend more time with my family, including my husband, two sons, and three adorable grandchildren. Next slide, please. So here's a photo of uh, me and my husband, Don, on a recent trip to France. And then the other picture is a picture of me with my uh, son, daughter-in-law, and two out of the three grandkids. Next slide, please. So here's what I'll be addressing today. Please don't feel you need to take notes. Again, most of this is covered in the policy brief that I prepared for LTCCC. So we're gonna start with a discussion of what we mean by transparency and why increasing transparency is so important. Then I'll give a brief history on how transparency has been increasing over the years, but why might record. Thank you. So I'm Haley Cronquist, policy attorney here at the Long-Term Care Community Coalition. Uh, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to improving care and quality of life for those uh, who live in long-term care settings. Uh, we do that through policy research and analysis, systems advocacy, and public education. And we are also the home to two local long-term care ombudsman programs here in New York State. The next slide, please, thanks. So today's webinar uh, features policy expert and long-term or long-time advocate, Eileen Henshaw. Eileen has been working uh, with LTCCC for the past few months on various policy briefs, including the brief that she will discuss today, which is focused on transparency in nursing homes. And again, materials from today's webinar will be posted on our website in the next day or so. Um, so be sure to check it out if you wanna see her slides or watch the video again. 
Um, she has an excellent presentation ready for you all today. So thank you again for joining us and I will turn it over to Eileen. Thanks so much, Haley. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Before we get started, I'd like to thank Richard Mollett and the wonderful people at the Long-Term Care Community Coalition, including Haley, Eric Goldwine, and Sarah Rosenberg for the work they do each day to further quality care and for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Next slide, please. So for those of you who don't know me, I've been working in the field of long-term care advocacy for about three decades now. I started my professional career as an attorney, but I quickly pivoted to consumer advocacy when I discovered that representing manufacturers of toxic substances and similar clients was really not my thing. So early in my career, I worked with a small nonprofit on legislation to advance consumer protections, especially food safety. And then I served as legislative counsel to an organization that represented the state's chief legal officers. My nursing home advocacy began when my father became ill and he needed long-term care. I was appalled by the care he was receiving at one of the so-called top nursing homes in the state. And I joined with other family members to form a statewide citizens advocacy organization. We later moved my father to a home in Virginia. And while the care in that home was better, there were still significant problems. Again, I worked with family members and together we worked to stop some bad legislation. Fast forward in 2001, I joined the State Government Affairs Department of AARP, and then for eight years, I led their state advocacy work on health and long-term care issues. I recently left AARP to work as a consultant, to travel, and to spend more time with my family, including my husband, two sons, and three adorable grandchildren. Next slide, please. So here's a photo of uh, me and my husband, Don, on a recent trip to France. And then the other picture is a picture of me with my uh, son, daughter-in-law, and two out of the three grandkids. Next slide, please. So here's what I'll be addressing today. Please don't feel you need to take notes. Again, most of this is covered in the policy brief that I prepared for LTCCC. So we're gonna start with a discussion of what we mean by transparency and why increasing transparency is so important. Then I'll give a brief history on how transparency has been increasing over the years, but why much more is needed. And then I'll talk about how these efforts are taking place at both the state and federal levels. I'll highlight some specific recommendations to improve transparency, and then we'll recap with some key takeaways and of course, I'd love to answer any questions you might have. So next slide, please. Let's take a look at this short video clip. Carolina's worst COVID-19 outbreak is shut down permanently. The Citadel of Salisbury closed its doors after federal investigators found substandard care that actually harmed patients. WBTV anchor Siobhan Bryan joins us now with a look at the serious problems that led the nursing home to shut its door for good. Absolutely, Maureen, an outbreak of COVID-19 at the Citadel was so bad, the CDC sent a strike team to figure out what was going on there. During that outbreak, there were 168 cases of COVID and 21 deaths. It was just the start of a number of problems that plagued the facility up until now. The Citadel recently lost its agreement with Medicare because of that substandard care. The Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services says it conducted on-site health and safety surveys multiple times over the past few years, and the facility did not meet federal requirements. A state inspection conducted back in April of this year found multiple problems, including some staff working 22 hours straight. There was another issue where a resident didn't have their bandages changed for weeks, and there were a number of medication errors as well. Now, many of the residents moved outright after the government pulled the Medicare agreement. There is a class action lawsuit against this facility. Jamie, Maureen. Siobhan, thank you. There okay. Thanks, Eric. So, so as you just heard, a nursing home in Salisbury, Maryland called the Citadel just closed up shop 
After the federal agency that monitors nursing homes, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, terminated it from the Medicare and Medicaid programs. Now, although the reporter didn't mention this, it's helpful for our discussion today to know that the Citadel had been placed on the federal government's special focus facility program. And that's sort of a nursing home blacklist. Um, and they were on that list for close to two years before it was terminated. And it wasn't its first time on the list. And what the reporter also didn't mention is that the Citadel is one of 36 facilities in North Carolina sharing common ownership and affiliation with a private equity firm called the Porter Piccolo Group. Now, wouldn't it have been helpful for the residents and their families who moved out of the Citadel to know the other facilities that were owned by Porter Piccolo in that state? And they probably didn't have this information. In fact, if you go on the federal government's nursing home website, Care Compare, it was previously known as Nursing Home Compare. While there is clearly an indication that the home is a bad one, Nowhere do you see that it shares ownership with dozens of other nursing homes in that state. In fact, as of 2020, the Porto Piccolo Group owned over 100 nursing homes in eight different states, as well as at least five management companies that run these facilities. During the height of the pandemic, they also acquired at least 22 facilities with little to no opposition. Despite having poor safety records at dozens of the company's other nursing homes, including infection control issues and shortages of staff. Now, the Porta Piccolo Group, like many other private equity firms, is known for scooping up mostly poor performing facilities and lowering expenditures so they can return profits to their investors. Spending on staffing and supplies generally decreases at private equity owned homes as does quality of care. What does increase is mortality rates, the use of antipsychotic drugs, the payments to management companies, payments to owners of real estate, all parties that often share common ownership. One of the nursing homes that Porta Piccolo purchased and rebranded during COVID is the nursing home where my father lived over a decade ago. And another local home that I am quite familiar with was a home with a history of poor quality. And that was also purchased by Porta Piccolo and rebranded. Now, anybody in my neck of the woods would certainly benefit by knowing that these two homes had the same owners, but you'd have to do a lot of digging to figure that out. And wouldn't it make sense for a family member considering one of these homes for a loved one to know the poor track record of its owners in the neighboring state of North Carolina. Really, there's no easy way to find that out either. Here are some other questions. Wouldn't it be good for regulators in North Carolina to monitor the other homes in that state that were owned by Porta Piccolo? Wouldn't it make sense for them to share this information with the other states where there are Porta Piccolo owned homes? Maybe there should be a nationwide database to share this information with other states and the federal government. How about a centralized application system so that states don't have to reinvent the wheel when they're scrutinizing any purchases this group is contemplating? And finally, shouldn't we all be able to know exactly how profitable these companies are and how they are spending public dollars especially when they say they're not turning a profit and couldn't possibly meet minimum safe staffing levels. Now, if you think all of that makes a lot of sense, the bad news is that very, of, very little of this is actually the case today. So take a look at this uh, graphic depiction of the structure of a present day nursing home chain. Now I've borrowed this image from the recent expert witness testimony of Ernest Tosh before a House Oversight Subcommittee hearing examining private equity in healthcare. While this looks pretty complicated, this is in fact a very simple example of a single parent company with only five nursing homes. And those are the blue hexagons. Here, there are a total of 15 companies 
within this particular corporate structure. The use of related parties, and those are the orange ovals, management, maintenance, or consulting companies and the like, this allows the parent company to file cost reports for a single facility that make it appear as if the facility is losing money. That's because its profits are being diverted to these related parties. Similarly, using related parties, an individual nursing home can appear to own no real property or have no assets because they are being held by related parties and the nursing home is forking over lots of money to use them. Now, according to Mr. Tosh and many other experts, there is currently no way for the public or for the policymakers to determine which nursing homes are truly making a profit. And there's no way to determine how much profit is being made by the, the parent company or how much the ownership of the chain is profited, profiting. Now, we all know from a plethora of academic studies that better staffing levels reduce bad outcomes. However, when attempts are made to legislate improved staffing levels, nursing homes claim they need more money. And unfortunately, these claims go largely unchallenged by legislators, because as we said, there's no real way of testing whether they are true or not. In most instances, Nursing home chains only need to provide individual facility cost reports, and they demonstrate that all of their nursing homes are losing money. What regulators and the public need to demand is the audited and consolidated financial information for the entire chain. Only then can it be shown that the chain as a whole is profitable and can easily afford to staff appropriately. Next slide, please. So for today's discussion, transparency means that high quality, complete, interoperable, and accessible data is available to those who need it. Thing on key issues such as ownership, management, and financing. So why is transparency a critical tool? It's important to understand that transparency is not the goal unto itself. It is merely a tool to be used by regulators, as well as legislators, consumer and legal advocates, researchers, family members, and residents to stop bad things from happening to current and future residents, to hold wrongdoers accountable when they harm residents, and to continuously improve quality of care. Next slide, please. Transparency is also the foundation for so many of the reforms we as advocates for nursing home residents have been seeking for decades. I'm gonna give you three examples. The first are laws that establish minimum staffing levels or ratios. Most of you are familiar with those. They're often written in hours of care per resident per day format or in a ratio format, like one certified nursing assistant for every eight residents. As I mentioned earlier, nursing homes invariably insist that they're gonna go broke if they have to staff at the minimum levels that have been called for over the years. And too often legislators and regulators are easily swayed by these arguments. So when we have improved financial transparency, including audited consolidated income statements from related parties, we are more easily able to make the case that these staffing requirements are more than reasonable and financially possible. Here's a second example. These are called direct care minimum spending laws. These are laws that have been recently passed in a few states such as New York, New Jersey and Massachusetts, and they require a nursing home to expend a set percentage of their total revenue on direct care staffing. Only with a clear understanding of facility ownership and finances can legislators be per persuaded to support these types of initiatives. And once these laws are passed, transparency is essential to ensure effective enforcement of these laws. Now, if you'd like more information on these laws, there's an LTCC brief that I prepared on this topic and one specifically on the New York law. 
A third example of the way transparency can be used as the foundation for uh, other laws are those laws that impose suitability standards. Understanding who is looking to purchase a nursing home, their track record with other homes, their interaction with related parties, and how they spend public dollars can help convince lawmakers to pass effective ownership suitability standards and for regulators to enforce those standards. Next slide, please. Again, transparency is not the end goal. It's a tool that can be used to pass strong, meaningful standards. And those standards have to be strictly enforced by well-resourced agencies and well-trained professional staff. Next slide, please. So the poor quality of care in this nation's nursing homes has been a matter of public policy concern for at least 50 years. A series of reports in the 1970s and 1980s highlighted serious and persistent quality of care problems, including horrendous cases of abuse. But it was really the 1986 Institute of Medicine or IOM report that was a game changer for transparency. That report specifically cited an urgent need for more information to better regulate nursing homes and to develop additional policies to improve care. It also called for a study to determine how this information could be more easily collected, analyzed, and made publicly available. And citing the increase in the numbers of for-profit and chain nursing homes, the IOM called for a better understanding of the many emerging types of ownership management and financing model. Next slide, please. Many of the IOM's recommendations became law in 1987 with the passage of the Nursing Home Reform Act, also known as OBRA 87. While today most people focus solely on OBRAs establishing the minimum health and safety standards nursing homes have to meet to receive Medicare and Medicaid funding, one of the many important accomplishments of OBRA were its requirements for public disclosure of key nursing home information, survey information, annual cost reports, and statements of ownership and control interests. Despite these positive steps, Detailed information about ownership and finances was still not readily available. It was often considered confidential and those wishing to obtain this information, say for purposes of litigation, they had to make a really good case why it was needed and they were frequently unsuccessful. Next slide, please. So in the early 2000s, the growing investment in nursing homes by real estate investment trusts and private equity firms and other increasingly complex ownership and financial structures made this lack of access to good quality data more acute. In 2003, CMS began collecting ownership information in an electronic system of records called PECOS. PECOS, stands for the Medicare Provider Enrollment Chain and Ownership System. It's used to enroll and store information on all Medicare providers, which includes most nursing homes. To this day, PECOS is considered a primary source for establishing ownership linkages across health organizations. Since all providers are registered and those who report PECOS information have to attest to its accuracy. Yet, almost from its inception, concerns about PECOS have existed. There are questions about its accuracy, its completeness, its usability. Among the chief concerns are the inability to determine hierarchy or the relationship amongst donors, and the difficulty in linking facilities by chain or by private investment ownership. In 2007, an explosive investigative report in the New York Times really shined the light on the serious negative impact private investment was having on nursing home quality. That led to numerous government agency reports and hearings in the House and Senate, resulting in the Nursing Home Transparency and Improvement Acts of 2008 
and 2009, which were ultimately passed as part, as part of the Affordable Care Act or the ACA in March of 2010. Next slide, please. The transparency provisions contained in the ACA are extensive, and they address ownership, management, and financing, public information, and much more. They're designed to make nursing home information more accessible and usable for consumers, advocates, and policy members, uh, policymakers. Importantly, this information was seen as providing a critical tool to hold nursing homes accountable for the quality of care they provide, most of which is funded by taxpayer dollars. This slide and the next couple of slides summarize some of ACA's transparency provisions. 6101, section 6101 sets forth the detailed ownership information nursing homes have to report to the federal government, including each member of their governing body, officers, directors, managing employees and other disclosable parties. Now, the term disclosable parties is an important term of art and it's intended to capture the broadest possible number and type of persons or entities. Now, the full definition, which I will not read to you, is included in the brief. Section 6101 also requires nursing homes to disclose the organizational structure of each of these disclosable parties, as well as their relationship to the facility and to each other. This information was to be made available to regulators and to ombudsmen upon request with the enactment of the ACA in, two, in 2010, and the information was to be made public by March 2013. Unfortunately, these ownership requirements have still not been fully implemented but they are fortunately addressed in a package of reforms that were announced in February by the Biden administration. And we're gonna talk about those proposals in a bit. Next slide, please. So section 6104 of the ACA required CMS to redesign its cost reports to require separate reporting of expenditures for wages and benefits for direct care staff. CMS was also required to classify expenditures into four categories, direct care staff, indirect care, capital assets, and administrative services costs. This information was to be made available to interested parties upon request. Now, while CMS has implemented new cost reporting requirements for nursing homes to collect detailed data on direct care expenditures by category, it has still not developed a plan to report this in a user-friendly format as was required by section 6104. There are also concerns that the cost report data are rarely audited and those who fail to report or who report inaccurately are not held accountable. Furthermore, experts who work with this data have found them to be difficult to interpret, inaccurate, and incomplete. Another important ACA section, Section 6106, requires nursing homes to report staffing data, hours of care per resident per day, turnover and tenure, and wages, all based on audible, auditable information such as payroll data. Implementation of this section was delayed for years and requirements for reporting of staffing data based on payroll data went into effect in 2016. Some of the staffing data became available to the public the following year, and it is now available on Care Compare. And then earlier this year, CMS began posting information on staff turnover and weekend staffing levels on Care Compare. Next slide, please. Two ACA sections specifically address ways to improve the public's access to nursing home information. The first, section 6103, requires certain information to be added to Care Compare. That information included information on inspections, penalties, and substantiated complaints, links to state nursing home websites, including links to statements of deficiencies and plans of corrections, 
and a summary of criminal violations that were committed by the facilities or persons working for them. And finally, all of this was to be presented in a consumer-friendly way and made easily searchable. Now, CMS has added much, but not all of this information to Care Compare. Results of health inspections and complaint investigations are now included. CMS has also improved some of the searchability features of the site, and it has added some, but not all of the ownership information required. Another section, section 6105, required CMS to develop a standardized complaint form that could be used to file a complaint with the state survey agency or the long-term care ombudsman program. This form is now available as is guidance on how to submit complaints and the contact information for state survey agencies and the long-term care ombudsman program. Next slide, please. As I've discussed, many of these the ACA's transparency provisions, particularly those to strengthen consumer information, have been implemented, albeit some of them uh, many years later than required. There are, however, some key provisions that have still not been fully implemented, and there are other serious transparency gaps. Among the major provisions that have not been fully implemented are the 6101 ownership provisions. While, C, while CMS has revised its Medicare enrollment and PECOS reporting form to substantially expand the information it gathers on ownership, it has not yet published final regulations to specify those disclosable parties and timeframes for reporting and updating information. CMS has also not established a way to audit the accuracy and completeness of the PECOS data or to enforce reporting requirements. And there still remain significant concerns related to PECOS. Researchers who have to request to use the PECOS data find it unreliable and inaccessible. Now, responding to these concerns, CMS announced uh, just past April, that it would publicly release data on mergers, acquisitions, consolidations, and ownership changes. So good news there. More work still remains on cost reporting. Now, while CMS implemented new cost reporting requirements, it has not developed a plan to report this in a user-friendly format as required by Section 6104. Again, there are concerns that this cost report data are rarely audited. There's no accountability for failure to report or to report inaccurately. Next slide, please. So moving on, uh, progress on nursing home transparency slowed during the Trump administration, where the focus was much more on deregulation, relaxation of surveys, reducing fines, and decreasing what was considered to be unnecessary data reporting. One effort to increase transparency was implemented and that was adding an abuse icon to homes listed on Care Compare, where there have been substantiated instances of abuse, neglect or exploitation. The home we looked at in the video, the Citadel has such an icon next to its listing. Then in late 2019, early 2020, just as COVID began to tear through our nation's nursing homes, the issue of who owned these nursing homes and how they were spending taxpayer dollars came under greater scrutiny. During this time, the House had a series of oversight hearings and legislation was introduced on the subject. Mr. Tosh's testimony and the visual I shared earlier with you was part of one such hearing. Next slide, please. That brings us to this year when the Biden administration announced in late February a package of nursing home reforms that were highlighted a few day, days later in the president's State of the Union address. Many of these reforms are intended to finally implement some of those remaining provisions of ACA, such as the corporate ownership requirements, holding nursing homes accountable for accurate and complete data submissions and required improvements to care compare. Other elements of the package build upon ACA's provision, such as creating a new database to track and identify owners and operators across states, using that data to improve enforcement and further studying the role of private equity 
real estate investment trusts, and own other ownership models. Next slide, please. Another key element of the administration's reform package is to expand CMS's enforcement authority to include chain owners and to require minimum competency at the corporate level to participate in Medicare and Medicaid. Also to hold chain owners and operators accountable for persistent and substandard care in certain of their facilities or in certain facilities that may have already closed. Some of these proposals are going to require congressional action. Others could be accomplished using CMS's existing authority. Next slide, please. So while much of our discussion today has focused on efforts at the federal level, it's important to know that many of the reforms that are being proposed now have their genesis at the state level. State Medicaid reimbursement policies are generally more restrictive than Medicare policies, and most states already conduct financial audits of individual nursing homes. But some states recognized early on that the na changing nature of the industry meant that much more needed to be done to provide regulators and consumers with improved ownership management and financial information. Early state action occurred in 2014 in Connecticut, where the state required nursing homes to disclose profit and loss statements from related parties that received $50,000 or more from a nursing home. Another early example was in California in 2018, and California strengthened suitability requirements for owners, and they imposed extensive reporting requirements to include reporting of interest of 5% or more in a related party and disclosing profit and loss statements of related parties if their goods, fees, or services were collectively worth more than $10,000 per year. Next slide, please. However, real progress on transparency at the state level came about in response to the pandemic. The horrendous numbers of deaths and infections combined with the constant drumbeat from an industry demanding more funds. State regulators and legislators needed to get a handle on who owned these homes, who was running them, and what they were doing with the dollars that were already flowing to them. New York was one of the first states to pass a strong COVID era transparency law. The law requires nursing homes to disclose common or familial ownership. They have to attest to the accuracy of these disclosures on an annual basis. They have to obtain approval before guaranteeing the debt of a third party. And they have to notify the state before entering any agreement related to its real property. New Jersey was another state that enacted strong transparency legislation. A first law signed in May 2021 focuses on increasing the state's authority over the sale and purchase of facilities. It requires a nursing home to provide the names, contact info, organizational chart of companies intending to buy a facility. They have to provide any lease or management agreements a list of all facilities the buyer has owned in the past five years, and financial audits of these facilities. Any application for change in ownership now has to be posted online, and the state has to review the quality and safety record of the prospective purchaser. Another law signed in January 22 requires nursing homes to make publicly available owner-certified financial statements and their most recent cost reports. Next slide, please. So here's another example of a recent transparency reform. In California, a package of nursing home reform bills, including strong transparency provisions, was signed into law in October 2021. Now, this package was crafted by California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform, or CANR, and the transparency reforms significantly expand the reporting requirements for nursing homes. The new law requires nursing homes to file an annual consolidated financial report that includes data from all operating entities, all license holders and related parties. The filing has to include a visual representation of the organization structure, 
and a duly authorized official must certify the report and attest to its completeness. And all of this gets posted to the state's website. Another interesting provision establishes shared liability for entities that share ownership or control of a nursing home. So under this law, related parties will be liable for unpaid fines and other fees due from related parties. So if, if you're interested in seeing Hanner's original proposal, which is very comprehensive and addresses far more than transparency reforms, we have included that in the appendix to the transparency report. Next slide, please. So here's another example of some potentially promising transparency legislation in a red state, Florida. In response to the pandemic and the need to better scrutinize chains, Florida enacted legislation in 2021 requiring nursing homes and their home offices to report their actual expenditures and revenues on an annual basis. The chief financial officer must certify the data as complete and accurate, and the information has to include the year end balance sheet, income statement, statement of cash flow, statement of retained earnings. What is quite interesting is that building upon this law, the legislator just this year now requires the report to be audited. And this provision just took effect July 1st. Now that's the good news. The bad news is that, unfortunately, the legislature also passed and the governor signed a bill that significantly reduces by 20 percent the minimum amount of direct nursing care that residents must receive. So it's going to be very important for advocates to use this new, these new transparency requirements and the audits to reverse this unfortunate development. So if you want more information uh, the policy briefs has links to all of these new state transparency laws. Now let's move to some recommendations. Next slide, please. The next three slides contain recommendations for lawmakers and other policymakers. Some are addressed in the Biden administration's suite of nursing home proposals, and an asterisk appears on the slides where the recommendation is specifically addressed. Now is really the optimum moment to advance these proposals when nursing homes are intensively lobbying lawmakers for more funding and or for reducing quality standards. And as you look at these recommendations, I'd ask you to think about the video clip. How could these recommendations, if enacted, have prevented what happened there or helped residents or future residents of nursing homes in that state or other states? So the first group of recommendations addresses the gaps in ownership transparency information. We truly need a nationwide database so that owners and operators can be tracked across states. Similarly, there ought to be a centralized application system for those wishing to purchase a nursing home. We need to get much more cooperation among states and between the states and the federal government, this can help maximize limited enforcement dollars. PECOS improvements should include opening up the underlying data sources and expanding reporting to cover related party and private equity models. These ownership reports need to be audited and there need to be penalties for failing to meet those requirements. CMS needs to be authorized to focus on chains and impose penalties at the corporate level. And finally, sufficient funds must be allocated to accomplish all of the above. Next slide, please. Here are recommendations for financial and accountability transparency. You're gonna see some common themes from the previous set of recommendations. Nursing homes have to be required to provide on an annual basis, consolidated financial reports of income from all sources. And this includes income from all operating entities and related parties. These reports have to be audited annually. We need to coordinate state and federal financial oversight efforts, including holding joint Medicaid and Medicare audits. And there needs to be adequate funding to hire and retain the skilled professionals needed to perform this work. Next slide, please. 
Here are some recommendations about public information transparency. First, public access to data needs to be the default, and that includes full access to data sources in PECOS and Care Compare. Redactions of information should be extremely limited and used sparingly only to protect resident privacy. All of this information needs to be made available on a timely basis in a user-friendly format and easily searchable. Care Compare should easily allow searches by chain and common ownership. Plans of correction need to be included along with the statements of deficiency on Care Compare. And you won't be surprised by the last recommendation is the need for adequate funding to accomplish all of the above. Next slide, please. So here's a quick recap. We've discussed how the lack of transparency has been a barrier to improving nursing home care for decades. And we've looked how improvements have been made incrementally over the past 50 years. We've seen how the increasing complexity of ownership and financing models, including the rise of chains and private equity ownership, has made it even harder to ensure quality care and pinpoint bad actors. Individual nursing homes may appear to be unprofitable, on paper because those profits are being siphoned off to related companies and away from resident care. Don't forget that nursing homes are funded by taxpayer dollars and they receive millions of dollars in new funds to deal with COVID related expenditures, but they were subject to little accountability for how these funds were spent. We need transparency reforms urgently to prevent bad actors from running nursing homes and providing substandard care. We need them to ensure that public dollars are used to benefit residents and to provide the public with the information they need to choose quality care. And finally, transparency reforms are a tool. They're a tool to advance other key important and, and critical reforms, such as staffing minimums and direct care spending mandates. So I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to taking any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Eileen, for your excellent presentation and all of your incredible work on the brief. Uh, it is so informative and useful um, for why we need uh, transparency in nursing homes. Um, and I've been watching the chat throughout and I'm, I'm really pleased to see people from across the US joining us today. Um, I hope other people are having cooler uh, weather than New York City. I, my probably 100 year old uh, air conditioner does not seem to be keeping up. Um, but there are also several questions in the Q&A, so I want to get to those. Um, but just quickly, I want to plug our annual event that is coming up in November. Uh, this year's event will be held in person, and we are very much looking forward to meeting people that we have only seen on Zoom for the past couple of years. So um, get your tickets. You can join us at the New York City Bar at 42 West 44th Street on November 9th. Uh, it's going to be from 6 to 8 p.m., and we will be recognizing the Honorable Richard Gottfried, who has been such a strong advocate for long-term care residents over the years. Um, you can get your tickets at the link on the screen, and we will also put that in our chat um, so you can find your tickets there. And then Eric, you can go to the next slide. So just head to Nursing Home 411 for today or for materials from today's webinar, uh, the brief that Eileen discussed, and to get your tickets to our annual event. And the next slide. Okay, so here's our last slide. Thank you again so much for joining us. Uh, I hope you learned all things transparency. And if you're interested in future programs, make sure you sign up uh, for our alerts at nursinghome411.org slash join. It's also in the chat. Um, and if you are an ombudsman attending today for credit, please watch out for an email confirming your attendance today. I'm gonna hand it off to Richard now for the Q&A. Thanks again, Eileen. My pleasure. Thanks, Thanks, Haley. And Eileen, thanks so much for just a, a, an extraordinary presentation. And I do encourage everyone to check out the briefs again. Uh, we, uh, Eileen wrote one national brief with recommendations, as well as one uh, state-specific New York uh, brief, which, as Eileen said, New York was one of the leading states in terms of passing laws regarding, um, uh, re regarding these issues. So without further ado, some of the questions we have. First, from Rashmi Shah, uh, uh, the question is, where does one find key transparency information for a nursing home? 
So I'll, I'll get started then, Richard, I hope you'll join me in some of this. I, I think um, there is information available at both the federal and state levels. So um, the primary source of information that I've spoke about today is really um, PECOS, which is ownership data, cost reports that are available, um, and uh, a nursing home compare or care compare for quality information and ownership information. So those are the primary sources, but there are a series of um, other um, uh, um, sources of information. Um, one of the problems is that much of this information is not interoperable. So uh, if you're searching, you have to do multiple searches. Uh, and, and that's really why we're plugging transparency so much. We need to make this information easily accessible, easily available, interoperable, so you don't have to do multiple searches. Um, it is very complicated and there are people uh, much more expert than I in, in, in data um, who are, are struggling with this. And, and, that's, and that is really why it's so promising that the Biden administration is focusing on this. And we have high hopes that um, some of this, uh, the, these concerns will be addressed. Thanks, Eileen. And that, that's, you know, I was just going to mention also the, you know, pushing the Biden administration and pushing Congress to be supporting, and our, you know, our members of Congress, our representatives, to be supporting this effort because the industry is pushing against increased transparency and accountability. So it's really important that they hear from as many of us as possible, the public, that this information is really crucial. Um, the next question is from Francis Duffy. Why can we not require nursing homes to be subject to auditing by independent firms and then publish the results much like SEC requires corporations? That's, there's two questions, that's the first one. Sure, so there's no reason why we couldn't do that. It's a political will and the uh, strength of the, the opposition. So um, uh, none, of this, uh, none of these efforts um, that I have seen require independent audits. So they're auditing by an independent firm, but that is not necessarily the same thing. So um, uh, there's no reason why this couldn't be required. It, it, it's, it's an issue of um, opposition by the industry. Uh, and, and I would just add, you know, if you had, as, as, as Eileen mentioned before, um, right now the, um, the facilities sign, you know, they essentially sign off saying that they have attested to the facility staff or, or facility administrative staff. Um, and that sounds meaningful, but unless you have an independent auditor, which could be hired by the facility, but someone who is a certified public accountant, right. um, they have their, their licenses on the line. Uh, if they, so therefore that, that makes it that much more, that much more valuable. The second question um, from Francis Duffy was, and how much do the lobbyists for the nursing home industry contribute to legislators? A lot. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, a lot. I mean, the nursing home industry is uh, one of the, um, uh, they spend more money on lobbying than just about any other industry. I think there might they, be, they may be number two. I haven't checked recently, but at one point they were number two. Right. And the, yeah. Sorry. No, I was just going to add that the 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 head of the American Healthcare Association, uh, NCL, NCAL, which is the, their assisted living division, mm -hmm. um, he is constantly named as one of the top most effective lobbyists yeah. in Washington D.C. Uh, so healthcare in general, I think, tends to be a high um, uh, have a high, a lot of money that goes to the legislators, both on the state level as well as the federal level. But that's particularly true. In, uh, with nursing homes. Uh, Francis Duffy actually had a, a, set, a third question, excuse me. These PL reports, are they done in house or by an independent accounting firm? Well, they're done in house, uh, as, as Aline was saying. We were, as we were just talking about in uh, response to your previous question, they, uh, it would be good if they were done by independent accounting firms at, at the very least. Uh, the next question is from Hang Wu. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Where could be possibly uh, find the data about Medicaid reimbursement for nursing homes. Uh, does the reimbursement in regards to Medicaid payment rates, uh, are they, will they be transparent to the public? 
So um, your state has all, you know, uh, has information on how they reimburse nursing homes um, and what nursing homes receive from Medicaid. Um, you'll have to go to CMS and some of those very difficult data sources to find out what Medicare is, is paying nursing homes. Um, Medicaid is a little more um, uh, easily accessible information. Thanks, Sophie. Uh, John Rhoda um, uh, asked, uh, well, first, excellent presentation, thanks. Um, thanks, John. Do new or proposed reporting requirements regarding related organizations also apply, excuse me, to home care, hospice care, assisted living, et cetera? No, this is, this is nursing homes specifically, exclusively, yeah. Yeah, that, that, and that's a really interesting question. We often in our programs get, uh, get uh, see questions from people who are asking about whether whatever we're talking about applies to assisted living specifically. And invariably the answer is no, because assisted living is not regulated at all by the federal, um, by the federal government. Home care and hospice are to, to some extent, but um, none of those, as Eileen said, none of them, um, uh, none of what we're talking about uh, in terms of the federal efforts are applicable to those settings. And it's and, just a little bit, yeah, sorry, Lee. Yeah, no, um, and I'm not sure that there have been any such kinds of efforts at the state level to capture more than nursing homes. Um, I'm not aware of them, that they may exist because the problems exist in uh, assisted living as well, especially assisted living facilities that are part of a, um, you know, that are owned by a private investment firm or part of a chain. Um, so the same problems exist. And I'm sure there are efforts that need to be done there to improve the transparency. Thanks, yeah, I agree. Uh, Tony Chikatel, hi Tony, uh, says in California, we've had trouble with nursing home owners evading the federal definition of a related party. Mm -hmm. Are there any states with more expansive definitions of related party? That's a great question. I, I think New York has a good one. Um, uh, and I think one of the, the things that the federal government has not yet done is issue those very specific regs to define um, related parties. So that would be an area for all of us to get involved in to ensure that that is um, uh, enforceable, meaningful, um, and expansive enough. Thanks. And I, I thought there were, I thought I read recently there was a bill in California, not a law, but a bill that, that somewhat addressed this. Um, and then uh, uh, Susie Fajal, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, uh, owners in California uh, buys, an owner in California buys, quote unquote, the bankrupt nursing homes, rents the physical plant building from the owners and then sub rents to his wife for double what he's paying the property owner. Yeah. Then the quote unquote loss is factored into his annual cost report. How does he get away with this? Because no one's enforcing it and no one's auditing. Um, enforcement is really the key here. We can have really good laws. Uh, we need people who understand this very complex system, um, who are good at numbers and accounting to be able to figure this out and to follow the money. Um, so so we, we need good laws, but we need good enforcement and we need people who are uh, equipped to, to do the enforcement, which is really a huge issue at uh, certainly at the state level. I'm not as familiar at the federal level in terms of their capacity, but um, many states are um, uh, understaffed, poorly staffed, and truly need, um, it, you know, if you're going to lobby for any of this, you need to think about in, uh, the enforcement system. Thanks. We have three more questions here, so I'm gonna to try to go through them quickly. Um, the next question is from Michael. What do you recommend an ombudsman can do to help with these problems of transparency? Um, so I think the ombudsman um, can make a huge contribution in terms of uh, ensuring that there is that public information transparency. Letting you know, so when you have that nursing home closure, you know, um, letting people know that by the way, there are thirty-five other homes owned by this private investment fund uh, uh, group. Um, letting people understand how they can obtain quality information, ownership information. There's a huge educational role. And then, of course, as advocates, and you know, when 
uh, making proposals to to legislators and other advocates. What do you, you know, giving real time problems? Why is this? Why is transparency a concern? And what do we need to do? Um, ombudsmen who are on the ground have those real life examples that are very persuasive for legislators. Thanks, and I, and I would just add. Um, referring back to, to the report that, that Aline has written for us um, can be really helpful, and especially in thinking about that, what we hear a lot from, from ombudsmen and from families and from legislators uh, is that the facility doesn't have enough money to provide, to, to pay for more staff. They just can't do it. And um, that's just not true. Um, there is, as, as that great graph that um, that that Eileen had from Ernie Tosh, which you're welcome to, you know, of course, use any of our materials. Um, shows that money gets funneled out from nursing homes um, into related parties. It's quite a a common practice, and money also gets funneled out in administrative costs, etc. So I think, in short, just knowing that there is a um, there's a lot of finagling, frankly, going on. There's a lot of money that's pouring into nursing homes. And we're not seeing that translated into good care or good services or good pay for uh, for sufficient numbers of staff. And so, so to help fight that. Um, our second to last question, anonymous attendee, while most other businesses are motivated by consumer satisfaction, poor nursing home quality and consumer dissatisfaction have existed for decades. Strong nursing home lobbying aside, how do you explain this? How do I explain the fact that there is uh, like public satisfaction uh, does not drive improvements or it continues to exist? Is that yeah, the question? I think so. I think, so. Um, I think people choose nursing homes often in crisis situations. Um, they are, there are hospital discharge planners who send people to nursing homes that they're familiar with, or there may only be one bed there. Um, there, I think there is a lack of information sharing amongst uh, consumers about nursing homes and a fear of um, nursing homes, to be perfectly honest, to bad mouthing them and um, a fear of being sued by uh, um, saying something disparaging. Um, so I, th I think there's a lot of that. There's, just, there's a lot of reasons for it. But um, Nursing Home Compare or Care Compare was set up to really help change that. Uh, unfortunately, some of the information is still self-reported, um, but consumer satisfaction can play a role. And there are some organizations that do report consumer um, satisfaction. So uh, it's a huge problem, I agree. Thanks, Eileen. Um, There's probably our last question. Oh, there's one more that came in uh, from Joan Burke. During my time with the Alms and Program, facilities would change their name. One administrator share with me, choosing a name with the letter A, served as a marketing advantage. Okay. All performing facilities who change their names should be subject to a time frame, two to four years, indicating the former name for research purposes for people seeking long-term care. Great presentation, thank you. And thanks, Joan. So I guess it's not really a question, just a, a, a interesting and useful comment. Again, that goes to transparency. You should be able to search their history. What, what was their yes. name before? I should be able to search my dad's nursing home and find out that they've changed their name and that they're, they're, they also, the, the owners also bought five others in the neighborhood. Um, I, it shouldn't be so hard, and it really isn't. And it's, it's a matter of, um, again, of, you know, when, when the issue of more funding is needed, Transparency should be the answer. Okay, we need to to respond that more information on how nursing homes are being transferred, how they're spending their money needs to be you know it has to be concurrent with any uh, funding request. Uh, and I was going to take one more question. I'm, I'm sorry for the other questions that came in uh, from anonymous person. Do basic accounting rules require nursing homes to identify related party expenses? as such on any of their financial statements? Um, I can't answer that, not being an accountant. So I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but we could certainly find that out for you. If you want to put your name in the, I think it was an anonymous question. Yeah, it was an anonymous so question. If somebody wants to provide that name, we can certainly find that out, but I'm not answering any accounting questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Eileen, thank you again for just your wonderful Pleasure. work and important advocacy. and and a great presentation today. Thank you everyone for joining us.
And uh, we look forward to seeing you. Actually, we're, we're skipping our monthly for August for the summertime. So we'll see you in September. Have a good summer, everybody. Stay, Stay cool. cool. Stay cool, everyone. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye.